You're listening to A Scary State, and this week we're covering Nevada. So, Nora. Yes, Lauren. Let's get scary. Okay, so guys, our goal for this episode is to pronounce Nevada correctly the whole time, um, because we had to look it up and we thought it was Nevada. But we didn't want anyone to get mad at us for pronouncing it wrong, so Nevada. Nevada. Just watch us be wrong with this. I know, right? We're going to get so much hate. (laughs) Okay, so I have a really exciting story to tell you. what is it? Okay, so... You know how the other month we had, like, all of those credit card issues Uh with, like, just something annoying happened. But so, anywho, we earned points, and I wanted to redeem the points because we had to use them in a certain amount of days. And I looked on the app, and it said we had zero. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I know we do not have zero. We had a lot of points. So telling joe i was like okay you know what we're gonna call i'm gonna figure out why these points aren't working like i'm gonna call him today when i get home and he goes no no let's call tomorrow when you get home and i said okay and i was like but it's gonna be late he's like no no they're open 24 7 like just call tomorrow and i said all right well turns out he had used all of the points (gasps) but four he goes well okay i guess i have to tell you now and i go what And he's like well we don't have any more and i said why and he goes well you know how you wanted to go on a mini moon and I was like, yeah. He's like, well, I booked our hotel. Oh, wait, so this whole time there wasn't an issue with the credit card? No, there was an issue with that. But oh, we had, okay. like, we didn't have an issue with the points because he used them all for a hotel. Oh. So he was like, okay, I booked it from December 30th to January 3rd. Oh, guess my Guess where we're gosh. going. Wait, um, I want to guess. Um, New Orleans? Yes! Oh, yay! I am, I am so excited oh my god oh my god and he showed me the hotel we're staying in and it's like this cute little hotel that's like you know not your typical like best western or anything like that it's like a unique hotel i am so freaking pumped that is so exciting you know i'm having an issue with points too right now it's so annoying they so i forgot that i like selected to redeem them and i was getting cash back which was going to be deposited into my checking account and i went to do it again and then I was looking at the history and I was like, wait, I never got the money from the last time I did this. Yeah. So I call the bank and they're like, well, we're going to need like a week to investigate this. And I was like, okay, but you can clearly see that there was no deposit. Yeah. And they were like, yeah, but we still need a week. So it's going to be four days tomorrow. I'll call them. That's <laughs> I so swear annoying. I'm not a Karen, but it's like, come on, that's my money. I know. All right. Well, All right, Nora, tell us about Nevada. 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 Okay. <laughs> So Nevada, nicknamed the Battle-Born State, joined the Union on October 31st, 1864, and became the 36th state in the U.S., which is Halloween, October 31st. Favorite holiday. Yeah. Nevada got its name in the early 1800s from the Spanish Sierra Nevada, meaning snow-covered mountain range, which I don't think of snow when I think of Nevada. No, I don't either. So that's a little cray-cray. Interesting laws. It is illegal to drive a camel on the highway. Okay. I wonder when that law was made. And how many camels are in the U.S.? I don't know. (laughs) I didn't even know there were camels here other than zoos. Don't even think about pawning your dentures because in Las Vegas, it's illegal. Okay. Good to know. That's very interesting. In Reno, hiding a spray-painted shopping cart in your basement is illegal. How do they come up with some of these? It had to have happened, but, like, why would they go through the effort? Why wouldn't they just say it's considered – it's a class of stealing? Like, why would they be so – So spray-painted. Yeah. <laughs> In 2018, Nevada became the first state to have a majority female legislature. Heck yeah. <laughs> There's a road literally called Extraterrestrial Highway or State Route 375 that runs between Alamo and Tonopah due to the many reported UFO sightings along this road. Oh, how cool. Yeah. Have you ever seen a UFO? No, have you? No, I want to so bad. Yeah. If you've seen an, a UFO, email us. <laughs> oh, yeah, let us know. You sound really scared, Nora. <laughs> I am I was like, scared. I want that is to. freaky. You're like, yeah. it's, I mean, it's freaky, but it's interesting. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, a headstone in the Silver Terrace Cemetery in Virginia City has had many reports of a strange glowing headstone. Some people don't believe that a headstone could glow, So it's obviously a ghost, not the headstone. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So this is dark. Uh, There's a grill called the heart attack grill. A regular customer of this grill died from an apparent heart attack outside of the restaurant. Oh. They have the slogan, a burger to die for. Oh, oh no. That's, oh, Oh, no. If I was just, like, the person's family member, I'd be like, you need to pay us royalties for using that. Like, you're not just going to make money off of our family member's death. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) In Nevada, there have been three identified serial killers. Oh. 
Crazy. Crazy. All right. So today I, okay, I told you a while ago the reason we picked Nevada Mm -hmm. was because I saw something on Facebook and then I was like, this is what I'm going to cover. And then when I started looking, I completely forgot that's what I wanted to cover. (laughs) So then I went back and looked into it. So I'm just going to talk about it really quick. Okay. So a lot of people have probably seen the video recently on Facebook and other social media places, but I wanted to talk about the Devil's Cauldron also known as Diana's Punch Bowl. This is a steep-walled travertine geothermal feature and is located in the Monitor Valley in Nevada. It is 600 feet in diameter, which is about 183 meters. The water in this punch bowl, or cauldron as it is commonly known, is so hot that if you decide to take a dip, you will slowly simmer to death. (laughs) The water temperatures range between 140 to 180 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 60 to 82 degrees Celsius for all of our listeners who use the normal yeah stuff um and you can only access the water by rope so the video i mentioned that many people have seen gave me the biggest chills when i watched it i haven't seen it okay i'm gonna i'm gonna show you so this guy named tex rex wanted to test the durability of an iphone 11 back in august of 2020 by dropping it into the hot spring he did this by drone and had the phone recording during the drop okay so you see the phone going up yeah you see the phone flying over the little cauldron and then it drops in and you see it falling and then it goes into the water and it submerges and you kind of hear it in the water and then all of a sudden you hear these screams (gasps) like like very loud screams and some people have even described them as screams like screaming voices from hell and they're it's so creepy i didn't like the video and i had to stop watching because it's really creepy but apparently people say that they're not screaming voices or anything it's just gas escaping in an echoey yeah, cavernous space that's what i was thinking but i have my doubts <laughs> i'll show you it is creepy um but no deaths have been documented here so like it's probably fine but it's super creepy uh, so yeah remind me after and i will show you yeah that's wild. Okay, so speaking of water, that brings me on to what I'm going to talk about tonight. Mm. So, there's a beautiful and breathtaking place called Pyramid Lake. It's located in the Truckee River Basin and lies in the southeastern part of Washu County. It takes up 125,000 acres of this area. Pyramid Lake is the last remnant of the Lake Lahontan, which makes me sound, it sounds kind of like Lahaunted. Yeah. But whatever. <laughs> <laughs> which covers most of northwestern Nevada during the Pleistocene, Pleistocene era. Can't help you with that one. <laughs> which was about 2 million to 11,000 years ago. So it's been around for a long time. And a lot could be lurking down in that sediment. So Pyramid Lake is also nearly 900 feet deep. That's, like, really deep. The yeah. Empire State Building is only about, like, 1,200 feet, so not very much difference between those two. So Pyramid Lake got its name from the Tufu Formation that lines the shores and soars out over the water. So Tufu Formations are limestone cone-shaped things. Hmm. So the largest of these formations is Anaho Island. Other formations include Stone Mother, which literally looks like a woman sitting, Indian Head Rock, which looks like a man's head, and Popcorn Rock, which looks like popcorn. Mm -hmm. But I have a story about the origin of the Stone Mother. So the legend of the Stone Mother, which is what one of the rocks is named after, goes like this. One day, the father of all Indians, who was said to have been created near Reese Wither... Reese Witherspoon? (laughs) Oh my gosh. My dad would go, oh my god, Reese someone was stabbed. And I go, Reese Witherspoon? And he goes, no, with her knife. (laughs) Well, there was a stabbing at the Pentagon yesterday. Oh, I know. I saw that. And a police officer died. I know. Yeah. I know. Sad. Okay. So, near Reese River came to this area. (laughs) He found a mountain near Stillwater. Though he was a great and good man, he was lonely and wished for someone who could keep him company. So one day, much later, a person named Woman heard about this lonely man, but she was married to Bear. She wished that one day she would meet Man, which is the guy's name, Mm -hmm. so Man and Woman, But Bear found out about this wish and was very jealous. This caused Bear and Woman to get into a huge fight. After a long fight, Woman finally knocked him down and, with a club, killed him. After that, Woman decided to go north to search for Man and she began her journey. Her footprints are said to still be visible along Mono Lake. She had many experiences during her journey. One was that she ran into a giant who tried to eat her, but she was able to kill him. His body was turned to stone and that stone is still visible near Yearington. She did finally make it to Stillwater, where Man was. She was scared that he might leave if he saw her, so she remained hidden from him. That is, until he saw her tracks. After calling out for her, a woman came out of hiding. 
Man offered her food, and eventually Man asked woman if she would stay with him. And I don't, I don't know where I heard this next part from, but I've heard this next part before. So on the very first night, she stayed by the fire. The next night, she slept by the door. And each night, she got closer and closer to where he was sleeping. Mm -hmm. On the fifth night, they were married and eventually oh. had many children. So the firstborn was very mean. He would get in fights. He would yell at people. He was just like a horrible person. Ugh. So his father sent him away. He matched him up with some girl and sent them away. Uh -huh. So the tribe that came from him is now known as the Pitt Rivers, but he let his other children remain with him. Those children eventually became known as the Paiutes. Is it Paiutes or Paiutes? Paiutes? Paiutes, I think I so. think, yeah. Um, but the mother was so sad and missed her eldest son. She would sit near the mountain and look toward Pitt River country where her son had gone. She sat there every day and cried. Her tears eventually formed a lake, now known as Pyramid Lake, and because she sat for so long, she turned to stone. You can still see the stone there today, looking out over Pyramid Lake with a basket by her side. Whoa. So that's literally... I want to go there. The stone mother rock formation looks <laughs> legit like a woman is sitting there with a basket next to her. Wow. It's really cool. So Pyramid Lake is a sanctuary for many different types of animals as well. And if you're interested in seeing this beautiful lake, you probably already have without knowing it. Really? So it's been used as a default screensaver on many Apple devices. Huh. Yeah. That's is, cool. Yeah. I thought that was pretty cool. So Pyramid Lake has been inhabited by three different Native American tribes for years. Those three tribes are the Northern Paiute, who come from Eastern California, Western Nevada, and Southeast Oregon, the Owens Valley Paiute, who come from the California-Nevada border, and the Southern Paiute, who are currently in the Colorado River Basin and Maho Mahav? Mahove. Mahove Desert? Mm. Mahove. Mahave. I always pronounced it Mojave, but I know that's not right. Mojave Desert. Yeah. Mojave Desert. <laughs> But, but those Paiutes who were specifically from Pyramid Lake were known as the Chewiu Takuda, which translate to Chewiu Eaters. So that mm. is a type of fish that's very prevalent and abundant in the lake. Nice. So as it always seems to go, the tribes who lived here were able to live in peace and seclusion and enjoying life until 1844. White man. Uh-huh. When an American explorer, John C. Fremont, discovered and mapped out the land. This destroyed the peaceful tribe's land. Settlers chopped down trees. The pinyon trees were a major food source for the tribes. Cattle ranchers destroyed the land where the tribes had vegetation, as well as taking the grazing land that the tribes used for their animals. The Paiute people originally tried to live in peace and harmony with the settlers and would even trade with them regularly, but there was an underlying anger with how the settlers had disrupted their way of life and how the settlers had taken over the tribe's ancestral land. But at some point, the Paiute people could no longer take it, and eventually that anger boiled over and violence took over. Tribes formed raiding parties and indiscriminately murdered settlers who were on their land. Then, in 1860, an all-out war started, which was known as the Paiute War or the Pyramid Lake War. The Paiute tribes teamed up with the Bannocks and Shoshuns during their fight, which consisted of two violent engagements. More settlers died in this fight than ever before in any fight between natives and settlers. It was reported that over 80 settlers were killed, and it's no unknown how many tribe members were. Violence continued among these two groups until a ceasefire agreement was made in August of 1860. It is believed by many of the Paiute people that, because of the settlers coming, uninvited to their land, a dark curse had befallen the lake. Now, some people have reported seeing the spirits of a cavalry troop riding over the hill nearby, most likely on their way to battle. The Paiute also have many legends from this lake. The first is that a race of mermaids live in the water. I love that. Yeah. So this story goes that one of the mermaids fell in love with a man from the village. The man must have felt the same way because he brought this mermaid to his village to tell everyone of his intentions to marry her. But instead of a celebration, he was met with disdain and was told to bring the creature back to the water. The mermaid is said to have been so angry with how she was treated and how she was banished from the tribe that she set a curse on the lake. She cursed anyone who lived there to be met with hardship and misfortune. Many believe that it was this curse that brought the settlers to the area and that started the war. Another creature or creatures that are said to live in the water are the water babies. Uh, do you remember Harry Potter? What that? Of course, one... I remember Harry Potter. <laughs> okay, I know the one where they had where the Harry ate that. Fire. Yeah, he the yeah exactly. Weed. He ate the gillyweed. This is giving me such strong vibes I know. from that. That's literally what I was picturing this That's entire crazy. time. Yeah, like all this like underwater life. You yeah, know? like a whole village under there. <laughs> Um, so when asked about water babies, many locals get nervous and very quiet about the topic and kind of try not to talk about it. So these water babies are described as specters and are said to resemble babies, but with visages that are twisted due to anger, rage, and hate. They're also described as tricksters and angry cannibalistic killers. Uh-huh. It's actually their anger that keeps them alive. <laughs> so... <laughs> 
Sorry, it's like babies. So. I know. I know. So they are said to lurk just under the surface of the water waiting for someone to wander too close. They usually inhabit springs, but have also been known to inhabit ponds and streams as well. They take the form of beautiful human babies, but in some tribes, the water babies are described as having fish tails or appearing more reptilian. When a victim is close, the water baby will drag the person down into the water to their deaths. Locals say that the water babies often only go after people who are drunk or who are acting stupid. Whoa. So, like, don't disrespect the lake and you'll be fine. Yeah. But in an interesting connection, the sirens from Greek mythology actually share a lot of characteristics to the water babies. The main one being that they lure men to their deaths. So. <laughs> That's scary. <laughs> I know. Other stories say that these water babies actually come out of the water and kill people in their sleep. This is the explanation that many give for why the elderly and ill die in their sleep. <laughs> there are a couple of different stories for how these water babies came to be. One story comes from the European settlers, of course. Mm -hmm. They said that the water babies were caused by the Paiute tribes. They said, that, Of course they did. Of course. They said that the tribes would take unwanted and deformed babies from the tribe and throw them into their water to their deaths. They apparently did this to keep the tribe strong and weed out any weak links. So the babies are those babies that were thrown into the water. Again, this was a tale formulated by the European settlers, probably to make the Native Americans look like savages, which really is horrible. Yeah. Um, but the Paiute have a different explanation for the water babies. They say that the babies are a result of a giant serpent who lives in the lake. So one day, a mother was washing her clothes in the lake, and a demonic serpent came out of the water to feed on the mother's baby. The serpent ate the child and took on the baby's form. The mother didn't know that her child had been taken, and in its place was a serpent, so she went to her child to start feeding it. That's when the serpent attacked and started eating the mother. A medicine man, I know, a medicine man or shaman was called immediately. This was when a deal was made. The demon would be free to inhabit the lake and have it as its own, free to prowl in whatever form it pleases mm -hmm. if the young mother was restored back to health. The demon kept up his end of the deal with the mother fully recovering, so now he has the lake to roam around in. Wow. So they believe that he somehow made the babies. Huh. So even now, people who visit the lake have reported hearing the disembodied voices of babies crying and children laughing. It is even reported by people who have never heard of the water baby tale before. So people who don't even know this story will go to the lake and say they hear babies crying. It you is can't say that that's from gas from a phone. <laughs> right. Like <laughs> yeah. This is extra spooky because locals say that hearing voices is a bad omen. They say that if you hear these disembodied voices, you'll have bad luck. But if you see who those voices belong to, you're dead. Also in many tribes, the cry of a water baby is an omen for death, and the results of if you respond to this crying baby by actually picking it up will be catastrophic. I would never want to see one. Yeah. It is also said that the water babies are heard most in the early morning and evening hours. They're also prominently heard like during the springtime. Hmm. And so it is said that spring is a very dangerous season on the lake. The season has had many accidents involving fishermen who come to the lake to fish for the huge Lahontan cutthroat trout. So there's a large number of freak boating accidents, equipment that goes missing, and technical troubles, usually all in the spring. Huh. But there are also stories of drownings and disappearances. Locals claim that one person every spring goes missing without a trace. It's like the Lake Lanier of the West Coast. Yes, exactly. That's what I was thinking, too. So some people believe that water babies are to blame, or maybe the angry mermaids are responsible. But others blame it on bad weather conditions and a dramatic increase in water depth close to the shore. So you'll be at the shore, you'll be totally fine, and then all of a sudden it drops 350 feet. Oh. Yeah. So alcohol is also a huge reason yeah. to blame. Which is interesting that, like, they say the water babies kill people who are drunk. So it could just be, you know, they're mm -hmm. drunk, they, you know. Yeah. Swimmers and scuba divers have been mysteriously drowned in this lake, mostly in the spring, and some of those bodies have never been found. There are actually usually a missing poster or two around the lake. Some witnesses have reported that the water will be perfectly calm one moment, then all of a sudden will become extremely turbulent with waves without any warning. In a lake? In a lake. Huh. So you know how I said that if you see a water baby, it's like bad luck? Mm -hmm. So I read this story from a guy. Um, the story is like going to be linked in our show notes, but I can't remember his name. But he went out fishing and his wife had been like, please don't go. This lake is cursed. Please don't go to the lake. But he went anyway, as men do. And he, <laughs> he said when they were in their boat, like, fishing or whatever, he saw something in the water. And he saw it swim by. And he, like, didn't really think anything of it. He didn't know what it was. And then he goes back home. And the next day, he's out playing, like, football or soccer or something. 
and someone ended up kicking him in the mouth so hard that his tooth shattered and he had to go to the doctor and was like had an emergency procedure and stuff Mm -hmm. and he's like i honestly think it was because of what happened at the lake oh my god and i was like i mean it really could be (laughs) so one pretty gross thing that also happens at this lake is that the bodies of those who drown in lake tahoe sometimes turn up floating in lake pyramid and vice versa or pyramid lake these two lakes are over 61 miles away from each other (gasps) So there are two reasons why this could happen. So one, the Truckee River feeds into Pyramid Lake. Well, the Truckee River is mostly just overflow from Lake Tahoe. So Lake Tahoe flows into the Truckee. The Truckee flows into Pyramid Lake. Okay. So the corpse may just have gotten stuck in the right current and was swept over to Pyramid Lake. But it doesn't make any sense how bodies who disappeared in Pyramid Lake would go the opposite way against the current and make it into Lake Tahoe. Another theory, and an even creepier one in my opinion, is that Pyramid Lake and Lake Tahoe are somehow connected via subterranean tunnels and river systems, and the corpses somehow make their way from one lake to the other. So you think about it. You're just chilling in the lake. And then, without you knowing, there's like a corpse swimming through all the... Well, it's not swimming. It's being moved through like these underwater tunnels. (sighs) So yeah, that is Pyramid Lake. That's creepy. I saw it because it was like, oh, water babies and serpents. And I was like, oh, cool. This would be something fun to read. (laughs) And then I noticed all this cool stuff about it. And I was like, oh, this is so creepy. Uh, The the corpse thing got me. Yeah. I was thinking like maybe um, Pyramid Lake has a connection to Lake Tahoe and like it went that way because I just cannot accept the other option. (laughs) I can't either. Like it's just so creepy. And they're 61 miles apart. Like that is a long way for something to travel. It is. Not a fan. So, hey everyone. Have you ever had the idea to start your own podcast but had no idea where to start? We had no idea either until we found Buzzsprout. It is hands down the easiest and best way to launch, promote, and track your podcast. Buzzsprout has made our experience with podcasting both fun and stress-free by listing our show on all major podcast platforms like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, just to name a few. You'll get a great-looking podcast website, audio players that you can drop into other websites, detailed analytics to see how and where people are listening, tools to promote your episodes, and much more. Following the link in the show notes, lets Buzzsprout know we sent you, gets you a $20 Amazon gift card if you sign up for a paid plan, and helps support our show. Join over 100,000 podcasters already using Buzz- Buzzsprout. And remember to stay scary. Stay safe. What are you telling us, Nora? So, the Goldfield Hotel. Okay. Have you heard of it? I have not. I hadn't either, um, but it's located in central Nevada. Right? Nevada. Nevada? Nevada. <laughs> Dang it. (laughs) Actually, in a town called Goldfield along Route 95. To put it into perspective, it's just about halfway between Reno and Las Vegas. Okay. So it's literally like in the middle of Nevada. Wait, Nevada. (laughs) Dang it. (laughs) Nowadays, the town has only 268 residents who mainly work in tourism and gold mining. That's still a thing. Yeah. Well, it's like barely a thing. That's yeah. why there's like no people that live there anymore. In the height of Goldfield, it had 20,000 residents. Dang. Yeah. The hotel has a reputation for being the most haunted place in Nevada, Ooh. if not the entire West Coast. I love how every single state is like, we have the most haunted place on the entire coast. And I know. Every single Everyone state has the it. most haunted place in the entire coast. Or they'll phrase it like one of the most or yeah. something. I'm like, okay, <laughs> like, come on. It's all about how you word it. I know. This extravagant four-story hotel opened in 1908 with a different superlative, most spectacular hotel in the Silver State. According to TravelNevada.com, champagne flowed down the floor steps during the Goldfield Hotel's opening ceremony to celebrate the property's 154 rooms that featured telephone, (laughs) electronic lights, and a heating system. Can you imagine living in this time? I know. And these were luxuries that, like, most people had never even experienced. Yeah. And they couldn't afford it. Like, most people who had gone there had had some of that before because they were so rich. Can you imagine, like, the first time that, like, AC or heating was invented and you're just like, oh my god, I don't have to be miserable? What is this magic? Like, I can read at night without having to use candlelight? Yeah. The mahogany paneled lobby was furnished with upholstered leather benches, crystal chandeliers, and gold leaf ceilings. Plus, the property had Lauren's favorite thing in the entire oh, world. Oh, gosh. What do you think it is? An elevator. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> Elevators were extremely rare during this era. 
People so, didn't hate them yet. <laughs> Lauren, I think you were born in the wrong time period. <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> Today at work, um, I had to go up to the third floor with one of my trainers, and she was like, all right, stairs or elevator? And I was like, stairs, please. You don't gotta ask me. <laughs> and I was like, I actually hate elevators. She goes, oh my gosh, I do too. And I was like, <gasps> Yes! Wow, that's a special bond. I know. I you hold on to that. Now. Do you know I have this really weird thing where, like, I get it, this has happened to me ever since I was really little. I hate when I'm walking upstairs or downstairs and there's someone right behind me. Oh. Like, nothing has ever happened to me. It's just like, I don't know what it is. It's that fear, like, you know, when you were younger and you would be in the basement or, like, in a room and you had to turn the light off? Yeah. So you would turn it off, you would sprint. Yeah. I it's still, one of those things. Yeah, when I was at my parents' house, I would be like, all right, I'm brave. And I would turn off the light in the basement and I would be like, I don't need to, like, run or anything. And so I would walk, but, like, my heart rate's increasing. I'm <laughs> yeah. like, no, I'm an adult. I'm gonna walk this. I'm not yeah. gonna sprint. <laughs> or, like, I would open up in the bathroom, I would open up the shower curtain and, like, keep it open. Okay, I'm not going to lie. I still check behind the shower curtain. I do now, too. Just to make sure everything's okay. <laughs> it's better to be safe. <laughs> oh my gosh. Joe, the other day, so we just moved into our new apartment and I like couldn't figure out the lock on the window. I figured it out. But I found like this piece of like PVC pipe that I put there so you can't open the window. Mm -hmm. And Joe's like, really? What do you think? Someone's going to get a ladder and like try to break in? I said, yes. Joseph, do you need me to introduce you to the Night Stalker? Yeah. Do you need me to introduce you to any of the horrible the things that can strangler? happen? Like, right? <laughs> so I was like, excuse me. He told his stepdad, who I had a little thing behind the door. Uh -huh. And his stepdad was like, what is this? And Joe was like, Lauren thinks someone's going to break in. I said, better safe than sorry. Thank you very much. <laughs> I said, I have a true crime podcast. Let me live. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Oh my gosh, but <laughs> this elevator, um, it ran at 300 feet per minute, making it the most modern elevator west of the Mississippi and one of the fastest in the state. That sounds really slow. It's so slow. 300 feet per minute? Like, think about, and when you're in an elevator, it's like 15 seconds and oh, you can get really true. far. Yeah. Like, that is, oh it's quicker to walk. Yeah. But you don't have to walk. Exactly. And that's the thing. <laughs> yeah. So as this hotel essentially redefined luxury, the property had no trouble with vacancies. I keep wanting to say vaccinations. Like when I was rereading this, I was like, no trouble with vac vacancies. What's your mind's on now? <laughs> Appealing to the upper crust through the country. The man behind the hotel was George Wingfield, a successful and wealthy banker, mining tycoon, and joint owner of the booming Goldfield Consolidated Mines Company. So I think he named the town in Hotel Goldfield because he owned the gold mining and then yeah. his last name was Wingfield, so he combined it. Oh, that's clever. Yeah. Um, so to give you some background on George, he was born in Fort Smith, Arkansas in 1876. He spent his youth driving cattle across the sagebrush of Nevada. He considered himself a gambler, fitting that he ended up in Nevada, mm -hmm. and regularly oh, yeah. <laughs> and regularly squandered his wages on horse racing and drinking. He drifted from town to town dealing cards before bluffing his way into a job as a camp scout for Senator, Senator George Nixon in Tonopah, Nevada. Nevada. <laughs> so George founded the town of Goldfield and the hotel too, but by 1920, there was almost no gold left in the town and the population reduced from 20,000 people to just about 1,500 Dang. within just a few years. On top of the rapid decline, three years later in 1923, a fire wiped out 27 blocks of homes and businesses. So at this point, there was really no going back, and the town pretty much became a ghost town by the late 20s. The hotel was never the same since George was the owner. George's hotel went through a series of owners after him, including the U.S. Army during World War II, a private owner in the 80s who sank millions into renovations, and its current owner named Red Roberts. Red Roberts? Yeah. What a name. I know, right? That's such a, like, 20s name. Yeah. <laughs> The hotel has since fallen to such a state of disrepair that it would need some serious love to become ha habitable. <laughs> habitable. <laughs> I think that's right. It just sounds uh. weird. <laughs> While it isn't open to the public, the hotel is said to have quite the slew of permanent guests. Mm. The most well-known is a woman named Elizabeth, who was George Wingfield's mistress, who became pregnant with Wingfield's child. Oh, scandal. Yeah. To protect his marriage, he initially paid her to stay at the hotel because he wanted to keep her a secret, basically. But mm -hmm. he grew feel fearful of exposure, um, especially in that time. Yeah. So he ultimately decided that the best option would be to chain her to a radiator in room 109 throughout the entirety of her pregnancy. Yeah, that's definitely the way to handle that. <laughs> yeah. 
So she allegedly cried out for hours on end, begging for freedom, and Wingfield fed her food and water to keep her alive until the child was born, but then she just mysteriously disappeared. Hmm. What happened to the child? Well, I'll tell you in a second, but one theory with Elizabeth is that she died at childbirth, but many people suspect that George killed her. Oh, yeah. It's obvious. Yeah. And what's even worse than that is that the story goes that her baby was thrown in a mine shaft beneath the hotel. No. George Wingfield is literally, like, the epitome of a business, like, a dirty businessman with, like, zero morals. Because, I mean, it says it was to protect his marriage, but it was probably to protect his business, too. Oh, yeah. Protect his reputation. (laughs) Yeah. Like, because, like I said, at that time, that was, like, crazy taboo. Mm Mm-hmm. So during Goldfield Hotel tours, Elizabeth's apparition has allegedly been sighted and even heard crying, presumably calling out for her child. Aww. The story goes that Elizabeth continues to visit George Wingfield, I'm guessing to try to find her baby. Yeah. And the sound of a crying child could sometimes be heard coming from the depths of, of the hotel. No, that gave Isn't me that chills. Sad? I know. <laughs> Other visitors have noticed a strong tobacco odor thought to come from Wingfield's ghost. Because he would, like, smoke a lot. Yeah. Um, And there are accounts of his spirit pacing the lobby floor, leaving a trail of ashes behind from the cigar. Oh. Oh, that's creepy. Yeah. There's another account of him being a terrible person and father. (laughs) (laughs) Another. (laughs) It's unclear if these two stories go back to the same woman and child, but I couldn't figure it out through my research, and they had different names. Um, But basically, there was a lawsuit filed in 1904 by a woman named May Barrick. She claimed to be George's wife by common law and tried to sue George for divorce. Interesting. She accused him not only of emotional and physical abuse, but also intentionally infecting her with syphilis. (gasps) Isn't that wild? (laughs) George gave her a meager $400 to take care of their child. How much money was that back then? That's a good question. So it's about $5,433 today. So not that's too bad. I mean, but to care for a child for but its yeah. whole oh, life. Th- oh, that's not enough at all. Yeah. Therefore, his wife and child were left alone in the world without any support and died because they were in so much poverty. Oh. Isn't that crazy? And I was thinking about it, and as she probably couldn't get a job. Yeah. Like, it's not like you could just get a job as a woman. a woman. Exactly. Yeah. They probably wouldn't even consider her. No. So. And she's not married. Exactly. She's a spinster. Well, for this one, it said that it was a common law wife. Oh, yeah. Well, So that's why she was trying to sue, but in that day, they're not going to side with her. And then even someone like, you're a divorced woman or you're going through a divorce, like anything just looks bad on you if you're a woman at these times. Yeah. Like you can't, nothing you do will be okay. Yeah, exactly. So apparently the tragedy of May Barrick still haunts the town even after her name has passed from memory. Wow. Yeah. Two other spirits are said to haunt the property, one of a woman who hanged herself and another of a man who jumped to his death off the roof of the hotel. And then there's the stabber who is said to randomly (gasps) attack. Yeah. Who is like such a turn. Who is said to randomly attack those who cross the threshold with a large knife. Oh my gosh. So it's like he's protecting the property, I guess. We'll never walk around this place with a large knife, apparently. I know. Others have reported hearing strange sounds and experiencing odd shifts in temperature when visiting the hotel. There was also a report of a gun battle on the fourth floor, which resulted in a man being murdered. Literally the most random, crazy stuff. An array of ghost hunters and paranormal experts have visited the property, including ghost hunters. Of course. And other reality shows, ranking it as one of the scariest places on Earth, and even going as far as declaring the Goldfield Hotel as one of the seven portals to the underworld. Oh, how cool. Yeah. So one of the most famous episodes, Ghost Hunters, was one that filmed there in 2004. The host of the show, Zach Bagans, captured what looks like t- what looked to be a levitating brick as it violently launches across the room. At him. Just across oh. the room, yeah. <laughs> the hotel is considered private property, so if you want to visit, you can contact the owners and get a tour. And it's open for tours right now, so you just have to book it. That's kind of cool. Yeah, it is cool. But I feel like if they're singling out people visiting yeah. the ghosts, it's like, okay, maybe let's let them calm down a little bit and then we'll reconsider. Yeah. We're both like very busy. We don't have time to be like killed by a ghost. <laughs> so <laughs> that's kind of Or my chased thought. by the stabber. Exactly. None of those things sound <laughs> ideal. It would not be great. <laughs> But yeah, that's the story of the haunted Goldfield Hotel, which is literally in like 
pretty much a deserted town now. That sounds really cool. Yeah. And then one more thing I wanted to mention that was actually really crazy is that a big part of the town burned down. I don't know if I mentioned it. I don't think you did. But yeah, like 27 blocks of the town burned down in the 20s, and that pretty much solidified that it was going to be. How? Um, It was just like natural. I mean, it's like the desert out there. Yeah. So it that once that happened, it like pretty much sealed the deal that it was going to be a ghost town because there was like no gold left either. Dang. Yeah. Well, crazy. Interesting. Yeah. I looked up right when Joe told me where we were staying in New Orleans. The first yeah. thing I looked up was if it was haunted. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get to do enough research, but oh, Ugh. I like part of me wants it to be so I can say like, oh, I stayed in a haunted hotel. But then part of me doesn't want it to be because I actually want to sleep. Right. You know, because this one podcast I listened to, it's called Two Girls, One Ghost. They were talking about like their bachelorette trip went there. Mm -hmm. And so they were talking about New Orleans and it just made me want to go even more. It was like serendipity. Uh. But people wrote in stories about New Orleans and they were like, oh, yeah, this is a haunted hotel. This one's a haunted hotel. And I was like, oh, my God, are any of these ones I'm staying in? (laughs) Thankfully, they weren't. But Yeah, New Orleans. Oh, you're going to love it. I'm so excited. It's so awesome. I cannot wait. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for listening, everyone. Like always, please send us your stories and all things to a scary state podcast at gmail.com. And also follow us on Instagram at a scary state podcast. And we now have a Facebook page where we'd be posting things there too. So follow us there. Um, so I guess that's it. So stay scary. Stay safe.